I suppose I might as well be recording just for the sake of people who aren't here. Um, yes, so we are, um, I have most of your papers. Let me, I'll double check on the uh, paper proposals, just make sure. Yeah, so it looks like I have copies of everybody. So at this point, does anybody have any questions about the lab? I was just filling out um, the HMBC uh, little squares or whatever, and I'm kind of confusing myself. Um, do you mind if I go ahead and screen share so I can show you what I'm talking about? Yeah, let me set, hang on one sec. Let me set it up. Thanks. All right, you should be good. Go for it. So, in this section where it says correlation number one, the way that I've been filling this out is like this hydrogen that's highlighted here is the F hydrogen. And I assume this first a proton NMR should be the chemical shift for this hydrogen. But this next correlation, right now I'm putting the carbon correlation to this same carbon that's attached to the proton. And these other correlations I'm doing like the two or three away. Should this first correlation be one that's two or three away also? Yes, because the, the one that the carbon 13 that's correlated with that proton NMR that you have listed is not one that will show up on this spectrum. So you're just, you're saying, okay, here is the proton chemical shift I'm looking at 6.94. And then these are the signals that show up correlated with it. And then fill in the assignment section if you can, or if it's still um, multiple options at this point, you could put F comma E if you were not sure if it's F or E for that carbon. Um, and just as a note, it also might be useful um, to keep track of whether you're talking about carbons or hydrogens, if you refer to them as like, carbon sub F, C sub F, or H sub F to distinguish between the carbon for um, that goes in position F or the hydrogen attached to carbon F. Um, might, might be a helpful way of distinguishing that way. Cool. <clears throat> Makes sense. Um, all right. Yeah, so any, any other questions thus far? I mean, I, I, I honestly, I think I could benefit from us, like, I don't know, going through the first problem. The example you used wasn't in, like an aromatic ring at all. And so I don't know if okay. it's just throwing me or. Yeah, we can do that. Um, let me screen share. Oh, I do not mean on this, do it on. Uh, let me, give me one second to get my, my markup ready. No, we can do, let's do it all in PowerPoint. Um, yeah, so we'll go through it. And, and one thing that I will, I will reiterate here is that there are, there are lots of cases in this where you're not gonna be able to narrow it down to just one carbon or just one hydrogen, and that's fine. Or each of those that you can't narrow it down, write down the possibilities. Because what'll happen is if you can kind of think of it like a Venn diagram. If you're looking at your, um, you know, your HSQC, and your HSQC, you're able to narrow it down to that a particular signal is either A or C. And then if you look at, and you just leave it at that. And if you look at HMBC, and you still can't narrow it down entirely, but you're able to narrow it down to it's either C or F. 
Well, if you know from this one, it has to be either A or C, and you know from this one, it has to be either C or F, that means that according to the HMBC, it can't be A. And according to the HSQC, it can't be F. So if you can get it down to two conflicting options, then basically the only one that satisfied both of these two spectra is C. So you don't need to use just one of these tools at any one point to get all the way down to a single choice. If you can sort of Venn diagram it, process of elimination, um, it's, it's a lot like doing a Sudoku where you can say, okay, well, based on this piece of evidence, I know it has to be either two or four. Based on this piece of evidence, I know it has to be either two or six. The only option that fits both of those is two. And so that, that allows you to settle on one option. And so a lot of these, you're going to have to look at, go through and look at them multiple times, go through, give all the possibilities for all of the different options, and then go back and look at it and sort of cross-reference your different your different summary sheets for each of them to see what that will allow you to tell. And a lot of times, once you can start eliminating one thing here, as soon as you can assign one thing with certainty, that means that you can, that's gonna start like dominoes. And as soon as you can do that one, that's gonna mean, oh, I can do this signal over here. Now I can do that signal over there. So it's, it's a lot of it is getting that first piece and then looking at the possibilities with each other, which is really hard to keep all that in your head at the same time. I get that. <clears throat> so let's see if I can get PowerPoint to open this the way I want it to. Um, All right, so I'm just gonna have to do it. This is gonna be less than ideal, but it'll still work. All right. <coughs> so if we're trying to work through these 2D NMRs, if you have a 2D NMR, you also are going to have the 1D NMR. You're never going to get the 2D NMR without a 1D NMR. So at the very least, this is very good um, review for how we can look at a proton NMR spectrum and a carbon NMR spectrum and do the, the basics of it there. Um, and so that this assignment just starts by saying, OK, here's all of, all of the stuff we know about the proton NMR, and just says, here are your six signals. What's the integration? We're ignoring the coupling constant. Um, and what's your proton NMR assignment, if you can? And if you can't, list, list multiple possibilities. So when we look at the spectra for the first proton NMR, we get a variety of signals. Um, and they, they're all nicely integrated for us. And just based on the integration, we're going to be able to tell something about this. Right? Because just based on the integration, I know how I can do this. It's not going to be a total mess. Um, the annotations on Zoom just do not work the way I want them to. So let me think I've got an idea. All right, so looking at our proton signals here, um, just based on the integration, that tells us a lot right there, right? Because if we know we've got a bunch of integrations of one and then we've got a couple integrations of three, well, especially if we know we're starting from this structure here, we only have two methyls on this structure, right? If we only have two methyls, then we know what those, those integrations two and three are gonna be, right? We know, and just can put this here so we can reference it while we're going, 
we know that we can, there's my typewriter, right. um, say that these two peaks at the bottom, we don't know which is which yet, but we know that it's going to be I and H. Right, because if for no other reason, then they're the only ones with the right integration. There's only two methyls, which means that these two that have integration three have to be I and H. And we'll worry about which one's which later. Um, we also have three signals down in the, in the uh, aromatic region and one in between four and five. This is also helpful because, like I said, sometimes you need one, one thing you know with certainty before we can really get started on some of these. Well, we know that all three of these, those are going to have to be the aromatics, right? So those are going to be, um, those are the protons attached to the benzene ring. So we know that those three signals have to be F, C, and D. Again, we don't know which is which yet, but that doesn't matter. We'll worry about that later. We're just we're breaking them up into discrete groups so that we can tell the difference between them. And then this one right here in the middle, this one's really helpful because this one, I think I can make this, make my font a little bigger on my notations too. Um, the only thing that shows up in that region that's an the only proton we have left that's not a methyl proton or an aromatic proton is the, the alcohol proton. So we know without any doubt, this one has to be A. Right, and then, like I said, that's going to give us a lot of, uh, give us a place to start here. And this is what it means when, it, when they're talking about um, you know, establishing what, what assignments you have. So we go back over to the report sheet. So the ones around six, those were our aromatics. So we can go back here, that was F, C, and D. So we know that the integration for each of them was one. You know, our integration down here for the methyls was three. We know this was F or C or D. We don't know which, and that's fine. We know without a doubt, though, that this is A. And it was I and H, right? So don't try to do too much with any one of these. This is fine for the proton and mar. At the very least, we know that F, C, and D are grouped together. There are aromatics. We know that A, that peak A is our phenol. And we know that um, I and H down at 2.26 2 and 2.23, those are our, um, those are the methyl hydrogens. So now that gives us something to work with when we start looking at the cozy spectra. And so we didn't even need to look at the zoomed in version. Zoomed in version can be helpful, but remember with, um, with aromatics, a lot of times the splitting is not necessarily useful. So we can't trust the splitting necessarily. And because of all the resonance with this molecule and the fact that 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 oxygen is electronegative. So normally we might think, oh, maybe we could look at shielding, except that OH groups are electron donating when they're attached to a benzene ring. There's all those resonance structures where you're able to give electron density. So basically we're, we can't just look at the shielding with these aromatics and tell anything about it. So them giving us these, this zoomed in version of the aromatic region, for us right now, we don't really, can't really do anything with it. 
the cozy though does wind up being helpful because remember the cozy was showing us which protons are spatially close to what other uh, protons. So basically you're looking for carb or for hydrogens. It's the ones that they couple to are going to be the adjacent hydrogens. And so when they zoom in on this region here, we can see that we've got some, some coupling here. We've got this in this region right here, you've got, I guess we should do the diagonal first. So when you're drawing the diagonal, it's just exactly, or I guess, is it not? Now you just go with the average. Um, so you, you, because these things are, in theory, they should be drawn to scale and you should be able to tell and draw a straight 45 degree line, but because they don't actually, you look at the scale, the 6.8 to 6.9, it's like a two to one ratio, not a one to one ratio. And actually look like that's the line that I drew is down one over two. Um, so, but usually you'll be able to look at these and say, I'll look at it visually and say, okay, there's my diagonal. Um, and it should go 6.5 should map directly to, to 6.5 here and 6.6 .6 to 6.6. .6. And then anything that shows up off of the diagonal, and it's, it's going to be symmetrical about the diagonal. So you can really just look at one of those sides, really. Anything that shows up off of the diagonal tells us that that is physically close, that the the hydrogen that's associated with this signal, the one at the very top, is physically close to, the, to these other two. So it's the fact that it shows up next to itself, that doesn't really tell us anything. This is just showing that it's coupling with itself. Not all that useful, because that's, that's why we're looking for off of the diagonal. And off of the diagonal, we can look at this and say, OK, well, whatever atom this is, whatever proton this is, is physically close to two other protons. It's physically close to a proton here, and it's physically close to this proton. So if I scroll up, and actually let me just grab the structure we're looking at. So we're looking at protons, the proton F, the proton for D, and the proton for C. Only one of those options is really close to both of the others. Right? We can't look at F is on the complete opposite side of the ring from C. So F shouldn't couple to C at all. And really, normally we would be looking at this um, and we'd be looking at specifically for things that are directly adjacent, but the benzene ring with air, with the um, resonance throws that off a little bit. Um, but what we can say, we can look at this and say, okay, well, I don't know for certain, but I know that D, I know that, that's not letting me draw on it. D and C should be close together. So we know that D and C should show up as a couple, as a coupling. And we know that F and D should, are more likely to show up than F and C. F and C are so far apart that if there's going to be any other coupling here, it's going to be between F and D. So while we can't be certain because the, the benzene ring is, does complicate things, what we can say is that we're pretty sure that this signal right here in the middle is going to be is going to be D. Because D is the is the proton that is physically close to this proton C and physically close to proton F. So that still doesn't allow us to specify 
the others, we still don't know which one's F and which one's C. This could be F or C. This one could be F or C. But again, we're starting to knock some things down and get a better idea of what possibilities there are. So then, so that was the signal that was at 6.8 something. So if we go back to our sheet at the 6.8, 6, the we can be pretty sure that that's D. So as we're filling this in, we'd say, okay, well, 6.88 was had a coupling, had a, a correlation with 6, 6.94 and 6.67. 6.94 only had a coupling with 6.88. And 6.67 only had a coupling with 6.88. Right, because when we look back over here, 6.94 only had a coupling to 6.88, and the 6.6 whatever had a coupling with 6.88 as well. And right, so we still can't tell which of those is which, but we know one's F and one's C, or at least we're pretty sure. And then it, there's not really much else on the COSY other than if you look at the rest of the COSY spectrum, it's all just right on the diagonal. Right? So there's nothing really all that useful on the rest of the COSY spectrum. We're only interested in COSY when it, you get something off of the diagonal. And at least initially, the carbon-13 NMR is not going to tell us anything necessarily that the proton NMR didn't. Because we have very similar, very similar things happening. We have, we're going to have a bunch of aromatic carbons. We're going to have some methyl carbons. And the oxygen is not going to show, show up at all. And so when we look at this, and remember that these ones that are um, that don't have the peak labeled, that's our solvent. Those aren't aren't anything we're going to use. Those are impurity, so ignore them. The ones that are labeled, though, we can just look where they are in terms of chemical shift, and that's going to allow us to once again put them in broadly in the same into um, groups. So these ones down all the way down 20 and 10, those are the most shielded. Those are going to be our methyl carbons, so H and I. The OH isn't going to show up, so the rest of these should be, there's only six other carbons other than methyls, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Those are, that's all of our benzene. So if we're just writing in possibilities here, those are all aromatic. So B, C, D, E, F, G. Beyond that, once again, not a lot we can do with it. So we're just going to make note of it and keep going and maybe come back to it in a little bit. Um, these other ones down here, these didn't have any off-diagonal off correlations. So we're going to ignore them, just you don't have to fill anything out there, just write NA. 
when we're looking at the carbon-13 NMR. Again, we can't say for certain for a lot of these, but we can definitely say this is either H or I. We can definitely say that this is either H or I. And then all these others we know is going to be one of the aromatics, and we're not going to worry about it right now. And then the DEPT part, remember that that one, that one has a nice little label on the title at the top. It tells us which of the carbons are either have one hydrogen or three hydrogens, means that their peaks go upward or positive. And if it's two hydrogens, they go downward. And if there's no hydrogens, they don't show up at all. So since we only, only carbons that we have are The only carbons we have are um, either three or one hydrogens per carbon. It doesn't seem like this is going to tell us that much, except that the ones that don't show up tell us something. The ones that don't show up here at all, that tells us which carbons don't have any hydrogens. Because we know that there's carbon signals, there's three more carbon signals in the aromatic region, but only three of them show up here. So that must be the ones that are showing up here have to be F, D, and C. And if we go up to the back up here, the ones that that show up on the carbon NMR but not on the DEPT, those must be the, the aromatic carbons that don't have hydrogens, which would be G, E, and B. So we can look here. I'm going to zoom out so that I can see both of these at the same time. So 131, 127, and 114 have protons. So 151, 130, and 123 ones I circled in red have to be those are the ones that don't show up on the DEPT. So that has to be B, E, and G have to be in the red circles. And the others, and yours might be a little bit neater than mine. Um, but I'm just trying to use, oh, write a quick legend here. So 114, 127, and 131, those have to be F, D, and C. So then come back, coming back over here, this allows us to fill this out a little bit. And we can say, and sort of narrow down what we wrote here because we said, what was it? They, 151, 130, and 114. Those are the ones that have to be either B, E, or G. 
and we can fill in the others for the other type. And once again, we still can't tell anything necessarily about telling the different methyl groups apart from each other, but we'll get there. So again, so still at this point, the only one we can really assign anything to with, it, with any sort of certainty is we know the phenol signal on the proton NMR, and we know D, proton D on the NMR. We know where they show up. Everything else is still up in the air. So again, don't try to do too much with any one piece of this. We're going to start put it together as we can start looking at these others. <clears throat> All right. And so the, the HSQC is, this is the one that winds up being really useful in terms of um, connecting the hydrogen signals to the carbon-13 signals. Because this is the one that basically let us, it was a one-to-one -one translator. For the HSQC, things, the chemical shift from the carbon will only show up to one correlation for the hydrogen, and that means that we have basically a one-to-one -one translation. Right, so... Initially, that doesn't seem all that helpful because we haven't, we've only assigned a few of these. But then on the zoomed in version, the few that we could assign with, with certainty were the phenol proton, which is not going to have a carbon associated with it, and carbon D, right? We know that carbon D shows up at 6.88. So that mean, means that the hydrogen that goes along with it also shows up at 6.88. When we go down to the HSQC, we'll go to the zoomed in version. Here's our 6.88 signal. That's the signal. And on one axis, you've got the carbon NMR. And on the other axis, you've got the proton NMR. So we, were, we know that 6.88 is D on the proton NMR, so that allows us to do an assignment for the carbon NMR as well. We know that the signal at 127 has to be carbon D. And all of a sudden, that allows us to come up to the carbon-13 NMR and clean this up a little bit. Because if it was D, if 127 is D, that means that the rest of this we can basically cross off. We know that 127 is not F or E. We know that. This one is not D. All right, so. This one's really helpful for making the translation, but again, it's until we can use one of the other pieces to actually do a definite 100%, um, we know that this is the case um, assignment, then it's going to be a little bit tricky to use this. And just a reminder what this is actually showing for, for this graph, 
the X coordinate is the chemical shift of the proton associated and the Y coordinate is the chemical shift for the carbon that are associated with each other. So for this signal right here, the X coordinate is the shift for H D and the Y coordinate is the shift for carbon D. E. So our coordinates here are 6.88 for the x-axis and 127 point whatever for the y-axis. Right, so that's basically how we're translating this. It's not looking at the diagonals so much as you're just looking at the x-coordinate and using it to map to a y-coordinate or vice versa. As soon as you know the X coordinate for one proton, you can use it to find the chemical shift for the carbon associated with it. And again, we still have not been able to say with 100% certainty which, which of the methyls goes with which. So at this point, this is not necessarily all that helpful. Once we can figure out any one piece of this, we can get the other three pieces. And as far as filling these out, we would just, we're just basically filling this in um, with everything we know. So we can say, okay, well, the, so it starts with the 151. So chemical shift of 151. Is not showing up with a hydrogen associated. With it. There's nothing in this section. with the same Y coordinate. There's no signal to go along with the carbon signal. That tells us that this is a carbon that doesn't have a hydrogen. So filling out the report, she would say none. Then that is, allows us to narrow this down and say, okay, well, we already knew that. We already knew that B, E, or G had to be the, car the carbon with no hydrogen. So it doesn't really help us that much yet. 131. The carbon at 131 has the hydrogen at 6.94. And we know that was either F or C. 130, again, nothing shows up in that region. So that's a carbon with no hydrogen. One twenty seven, we got that one. 123, carbon with no hydrogen. One fourteen is correlated with the signal between six point six five and six point seven. We said that was. 6.67. And these last ones that are zoomed in here, 
the signal at 15 point something goes with the 2.2, 2 .2, it's 2.2, I don't know, 2.25 ish, or just use the, um, Roll up and look at what you had 2.26. We know that was I or H. And then the one at 20 was the 2.25 something, 2.23. So naturally, you might be asking, well, what does that give us? We still don't know what we can do here. This is where we start to put it all together. HMBC is really tricky to interpret, and it still has lots of options, but we already have a whole list of Venn diagrams basically ready to go. We already have a bunch of groupings that say this signal, this signal at 131, the carbon associated with that signal has to be either carbon F or carbon C. Only one of those will fit the data for this HMBC. For the HMBC, we're looking at not what's directly attached, but what's close by. And you'll notice that the HMBC, all of a sudden, the proton attached to the, to the alcohol starts showing up again. The proton attached to the alcohol that was right around 4.5 winds up showing up. And that, that gives us some information because it tells us Basically, when we're looking at this signal here, we're looking at things that are two to three bonds away from a proton. So if we're looking, if we start by looking at this signal, the proton signal, there are three signals associated with it. There are three carbon signals associated with that with that proton signal. So that means there's three carbons that are either two bonds away from the hydrogen or three bonds away. And if we look at that, that would correspond to, it's gotta be carbon B, carbon G and carbon C. The only three carbons that you can get to it, within three bonds are carbon B, so one bond from the hydrogen to the oxygen, two bonds from the oxygen to carbon B, three bonds from carbon B to carbon C. So that means that the three signals that are showing up associated with the, the um, alcohol proton have to be G, B, and C. There are three signals there. These three signals have to be G, B, and C. Well, again, that doesn't necessarily seem like it helped us that much, except for the fact that up to this point, we'd been basically breaking up the aromatic carbons according to whether they had hydrogens or not, right? We had carbons with hydrogens, carbons without hydrogens. This breaks up that dichotomy because G, B, and C, some of those C has a hydrogen, but G and B don't. So all, that allows us to go between those two groups because it, if we know that the three 
signals associated with the proton, which is zoomed in here, the, those three signals associated with the proton have to be the signal at 114, the signal at 124, and the signal at 155. If we go back to our report sheet, and so actually what we're doing is we're looking at this one right here. Um, so is it 4 point, 4 .55 was the height or was the uh, alcohol. It's correlated to say one, the 150, 124, and the 115. The 151.6, 114.9, 115.6, 115.9, 115.9. All right, so the fact that we have those three groups is going to change things because only one of them has a hydrogen, right? So out of our previous group where we were able to say, okay, well, I know that F, D, and C go together and G, B, and E go together because they either have protons or don't. C is the only one that has a proton and is within three bonds of the oxygen. So this basically allows us to, to assign C. C has to be, we look up the ones, okay, F or C, 131 could be C or 114 could be C. And down here, that allows us to say, well, that 114, that had to be, that has to be C because by, we're sort of Venn diagramming our way down. These ones, we could still not, we're still not 100% certain. It could be G or could be B. But all of a sudden that gives us, we know what the carbon 13 correlation for C has to be the 114.9 means we can go back up um, and we can cross off. We thought it could be F or C, and now we know that it has to be C. And that means this one has to be F. Right? As soon as we can start crossing stuff off, we know F, D, and C are. We know what their proton NMR signal is, and we know what their carbon NMR signal is. So once we get those ones, we can actually go down here and go to our, our final summary page and say, okay, well, we know the six, the, where did it go? I just got rid of it. 6.94 goes with 131, and it has to be F. Because this is our our whole goal is to get this page filled out with no ambiguity, where we can say without it without a shadow of doubt, this carbon signal goes with this carbon, this proton signal goes with this proton, and we just got a good chunk of the way there because now we know six point eight eight is D and it goes with one twenty seven. And we got the other one that has a proton, right? We know that, we know C is 6.67 and 114. 
right? And so you see how we didn't actually get to being able to do much of that assigning until we got to the very end. All we did was we kept lists of possibilities. And then at the end, you cross-reference those lists and use them to cancel each other out, basically. Right, anytime your list of possibilities for a signal doesn't match another list of possibilities, anything that doesn't show up on both of those lists, you can cross off because it has to satisfy all of this criteria. If we look at the number of which carbons could be associated with this particular hydrogen, this is hydrogen. F, I believe, yes. So we know, we actually know the chemical shift for F now is for the hydrogen is the 6.94. And when we look at the spectra, look at the big one here, the 6.94, actually we'll go do this one, 6.94, has two signals that show up there, two carbons in the aromat, two aromatic carbons. They're within a few bonds of it. So what are the possibilities for this? And well, basically we're talking about within two to three bonds. So if we're actually looking at possibilities, so it, can't be this one, but these are both fair game. One bond to the carbon, to carbon F, and then two bonds here, three bonds there. And these are all potential. So there's four possibilities for the carbons that would show up. And that's going to be these carbons in particular. Those two signals, so not all of them show up because this one's a little bit finicky, but the ones that do show up, we know that these two signals have to be have to be be only four options for, um, for those two signals are these carbons here. So that would be So if we're looking here, carbon G, we're just going to ignore the bottom ones for right now. We're just looking here. Carbon correlation one was the 127 and the 151. Mm -hmm. 127.55. And what did I say, 151? So that doesn't really help us. This one could still be B or we already had 151 listed as being B or E or G. We now know that and this one at 127 we knew could is D. We know that that one's D. So the other carbon that it could be that's showing up here at the bottom, that 151 could be B or it could be E or it could be G. Although down below, we already figured out that 151 could only be G or B. E was not on one of our possibilities here. So, this signal at 151 can't be E. We know the two signals up here 
at one 151 and 114 we were able to assign, but 123, 151 and 123. have to be these two. So B and G have to be 151 and 123. We don't know which is which yet, but that tells us again, we know where E is now because we had them grouped in groups of three, right? E was the one. So all the ones that had none were B, E, or G. Well, now we know that 151 has to be B or G. And we know that 123 can't be E. Right, because 123 has to be G or B, 151 has to be G or B. Which means E has to be this E has to be 130 because B and G have to be 151 and 123. We don't know which is which, but we know that those two are stuck up there. So now all of a sudden that gives us another possibility. So 130, we can now come down to the bottom and fill in 130 has to be E. Right? And those are the only two correlations for this 6.94. We came back here. This was our 6.94. There's only two signals, so we can't do anything more with it. We've got this 6.8 something. 6.88 is going to be another signal if we want to know what it is. we have to go back through and see if we can assign this. So we have three signals here now. So the signal, the proton signal at 6.88 has three carbons associated with it. Those are the carbons at 114, 130, 132 or so, and then 151. Because we don't know which one that goes with yet. Um, but what we do know is that 151, one down at the bottom, has to be either B or G. So we can make a note here. This has to be B or G. We know that the signal at 130, 131.8 has to be F. We know the signal at 114. We figured that one out too, right? Signal at 114 has to be C. So which which proton, which aromatic proton is only two or three bonds away from carbon C, carbon F, and carbon B? Or... C, F, neither G or B. So it can't be it, it can't be the proton associated. It can't be the proton here 
because that's only that's two bonds away from B, two bonds away from G, but three bond too many bonds away from um, F. So F would not show up. D, however, if we look at D, D the proton associated with D is one bond to D, two bonds to E, three bonds to F. One bond to D, two bonds to C, three bonds to B. This one could be, F should show up. Right, so this is a possibility. It could be D sort of makes sense. And you can put a question mark on it if you're not sure. Right. And then that's going to allow us to look at this other proton that's associated at 6.67 also has three signals. Some of them are the same, but one of them is different. Actually, two of them are different. So for this group of signals, we have something different, right? So we think that this one is D because that's the only way F should show up. Here we've got signal here, signal here, and then the same one here, which is either which is B and B or G. So because we B or G, we still can't be totally certain on that one. This signal here at 123, though, I believe we solved that one, right? 123, no, what do we see? 127 has to be. And one, so we got 123, 130, and 151. 123 is either B or G. 151 is either B or G. 130 has to be E. So with that in mind, we've got two, we've got B and G both. We don't know which of these signals is which, but we know that one, 123 is B or G and 151 is B or G. So and then E, something that can has to be close to all of those. It has to be close to G and B. And it also has to have E. Well, D could not show up close to G. So this one that's in blue is almost certainly going to be C, carbon C, or sorry, proton C has to be associated with that one. Right? Because they, the ones that are directly opposite, the ones that are para on the benzene ring will not show up here. And all of a sudden, that allows us to solve some things. So we know that 6.88 has to be D. And we know that 6.67 has to be C. Okay, so we already knew both of those. We just proved what we, we supported what we already knew. <laughs> 
So we know that D and we know C, D is going to be our 6.88 and C is going to be our 6.67 unless I mix those up. And then we can fill in these sections. We know that the 6.88 section we had the correlations at 115, 132, and 151. And again, B or G. 132, we figured out that has to be F. And 115, 114.8 has to be C. All right, so as you can see, lots of back and forth with these, lots of going back and checking what we already figured out. If you do wind up duplicating your effort, though, that should agree with what you already decided. Like I, we just went back through and figured out C and D again, even though we already had that figured out because I'd forgotten we had that figured out. So six, six, seven, decided that was C and that was correlated with the 123, 130, and 151. Not, not the 132, 130, which is E. And then the other one was at 123. And the 123, we are pretty certain is, or is B or G. All right, so now we're getting down to the point where, where we're getting to the nitty gritty and it can be helpful to sort of cross things off on here potentially as, as we figure them out. We know C, D, E, F. We don't know G and B. We don't know H and I. That's all we, that's what we're not certain about yet, right? We know everything. We can't tell G and B apart from each other and we can't tell H and I apart from each other yet. So that's what we're looking for. And so if we start from that idea, if we look at the protons for I, we don't know what their signal is yet, but we know that the protons for I We should have these three carbons should show up. And it can only be those three carbons because so F, E, and D are the only ones that should show up because those are the carbons that are two to three bonds away from the hydrogen. And same here for, for H, it should only be Those three carbons should be the only ones that show up. All right, so this is what's going to allow us to differentiate between the hydrogens on H and the hydrogens on I. 
because we know all we've assigned all three of the carbons that I circled here, right? F, E, and D, we know all of them. So those should be the three signals that show up. If we scroll down to the next. Next section here. F, E, and D, go back and check our report sheet. F, E, and D is 130, 131, and 127. So let me make sure I don't make some D, E, F, lowest size. And the other ones we know are C is 115. And we know that these other two signals are either G or B. All right, so all that to say is D, E, and F are these ones that are really closely linked together right here, right? And the hydrogens that will show up with D, E, and F are the hydrogens attached to I. So that tells us this signal at 226, 2.26, must be I. And that tells us that the other one must be H. And this one we never did fill in our, our alcohol oxygen there. Which then if we go back up here, allows us to say, okay, if we say 2.26 is I, we go back to our HSQC, 2.6 is I, that means 15.8 is the chemical shift for the hydrogen, 15.8. So there's I, there's H. So last but not least, we still have to figure out G and B. If we look at our structure. G and B are going to be tricky. There's no protons associated with them. Although in theory, the proton on D, the proton associated with D should have a signal, if it has a signal that fits either G or B, it has to be B because G cannot show up in the same signal as D, which cannot show up coupled to D. So if we look at D, we've got C that we know about, we've got F, and then we've got one, that we said it was either B or G. Well, now all of a sudden that tells that's that's the last piece, right? Because the proton on D cannot couple all the way with with carbon G. It's four bonds away. That's too far. So that means that this signal at one fifty one can't be G. It has to be B. 
So B has to be 151. which means G has to be the 123. All right, and so we missed that one at first when we were first looking at when we were listing possibilities, we didn't write down, we, we could have made that determination earlier, but sometimes it takes getting down to the end and getting everything assigned except for one or two things before you can see some connections that, that you possibly could have seen earlier. Um, and I know that that was, that's a pretty long convoluted process to go through this. Um, the main thing you're looking for is what are my possibilities? What is conceivably possible? What are the group of things that are possible according here? And then what are the groups of things that are possible according to this spectrum and where they overlap has to be true. Right, so I'll leave the last two sections here for you to fill out, and then I'm good. Still, we'll still answer questions about the second one on this. Um, and if anybody went through this and their answers don't match what I have here, I'm open to suggestions. It's totally possible that I mix something up in there. But as far as I can tell, this matches the data well. We didn't make any contradictions. If you're careful and meticulous about your note taking on this, then it should be really obvious when you do something that gives you a contradiction. Right? If you look at one spectrum and you say it's got to be B or C, and then you look at another spectrum and it says it's got to be A or F, there's no overlap in that case. And that means that you did something wrong somewhere. So just watch out for those. Any questions about any specific leaps that I made? All right. Well, I will turn you folks loose on it. Keep getting after it. The next molecule looks very similar, except with t-butyl groups. So you can use a lot of the same tricks and a lot of the same logic, just some of the bond distances are going to be a little bit different. But the same logic and the same tricks, if you want to call them that, the same logical steps for making these eliminations still hold true. Um, at this point, I made the connection or then made the uh, comparison to Sudoku before, but perhaps it would be better. It's more like playing three dimensional Minesweeper, where you're looking at things in this direction and that direction. And then, oh, wait, what about if I twist it over here? Oh, for, I forgot about that. It's tricky. I get it. But keep working at it. You can do it. And I'll, I'll stay on here until you guys are done asking questions or working on it for today. Okay. Thanks. I'm having trouble um, being able to assign the location for H and J. And I'm looking at the HMBC with the uh, proton NMR from 1.5 to 1.28 and the carbon NMR from like 22 to 42 or something. Excuse me. So the lack of protons makes it a little tricky, right? Um, but my my initial thought is that um, if you look at the HMBC, looking at which ones should or should not show up is going to be the best choice. So F should, both of these carbons, H and J, should both show up on F. Uh, 
but only J should show up on D. If you look at, at the proton associated here, you get one, two, three bonds. So carbon J could show up coupled with proton D. But carbon H will not show up there. That might be one way you could look at it. Yeah. Do you care if I do the screen share? Uh, you have to wait for me to stop mine first. But oh, yeah, go for it. Just uh, so looking at the based off the proton for F, it looks like it's. Uh, two or three bonds away from two other things. I have one of them set as like D or F, and then the other one set as B or G. I, I didn't even make the connection between J or H and F. But I don't but, know. So that's because you're looking at the zoomed in one, right? And the zoomed in one is only on the aromatic region because your, your chemical shift for, your, for H and J should be much lower. There you see, there it is. Uh, maybe in this area. So D has a signal sh show coupled down there. F has, it might be two signals. If you, uh, if you keep looking, there might be a zoomed in one down at that region. Yeah, so that would be, is it this one? Um, so that's proton signals. Go down one more. See if there's one more there. There yeah, I'm is. I'm making sense out of this particular one. Yeah. So they they don't have a zoomed in version of the of the aromatic hydrogens coupled to H or J. Um, but I did see, go back to this fully zoomed out HMBC. Yeah. The proton one might be helpful, right? Because the proton, so one bond to the oxygen, two to the carbon. No, that just gets you to G. Um, so you still can't tell H and I from the proton. C, the proton associated with C, one, two, three, uh, that just gets you to G. Yeah, I think you're going to have to, well, actually, and once you can assign K and I. I think I figured that out. Okay. So that means that this section down in the bottom right, so the second zoomed in version, go, go down. If you know I and K, no, um, back up, back up. Oh. Wait, uh, maybe, no, you're right. Keep going, one more. <laughs> All right, so the ones here, so this one is gonna be what's, what breaks it open because K, the protons on K, are two bonds away from J and three bonds away from E. So, and I don't know if, and actually in the region we're in, so the protons associated with K will, will couple to the carbon K because there are other carbon Ks that are two to three bonds away and it'll couple with carbon J. So, so, you know, so if you know that this is K, one, if you look at how many bonds away you are, one, two, three bonds from to get from car from hydrogen K to carbon I sorry, carbon J and carbon K. So these two, one of them should be carbon K and the other one should be carbon J. Yeah. 
it just seems weird because I thought the HMBC was showing things that were like two or more, two or three bonds away. And if I have K as the proton from K up here, shouldn't it not show the carbon from K as coupling or maybe Ex I've missed up. Except that you're, you're, you are normally correct, except for the fact that there are multiple carbon Ks. Oh, so they're calling the other two K also. Right, so because they're identical, but the fact that you are now this hydrogen is coupling with these two carbon Ks, not the one it's directly attached to, but those ones are three bonds away. And carbon J is two bonds away. So this one does give you everything you need. If you if this if this is right, if you got K right which you probably did, then you know that the two, the only two signals that'll show up in this area are carbon K and carbon J. And you can already figure out carbon K, you probably already figured out from the HSQC. So the one of these that's not carbon K is carbon J. And you'll get the same logic on this one for, for um, hydrogen I and carbon I and carbon H. Thank you. I was getting stuck on thinking that two of the three carbons in the T-butyl group didn't have any kind of assignment. So I was like, why is K showing up? It's, but yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think that was my last little hiccup that I'm good. That's in front of my mind anyways. All right. Well, I'll be here if you have anything else. Otherwise, finish uh, us writing up that, not writing up, but uh, filling out that summary. And you'll be good to go. And let me know if you have any other questions.